You might have heard before, it's all about interpretation. While this phrase is generally true, its logic sometimes gets distorted and gives way to a relevist worldview in which no interpretation is more valid than the other. Some people would say, as long as we can agree on Christ's life, death, and resurrection, we shouldn't need to worry about some of the quotation's secondary issues. This, in their perspective, supposedly justifies the idea that entire chapters of scripture and points of doctrine are not necessary. Some of the most contested passages of scripture should be amongst the most agreed upon by all Christians, and yet that is not the case with the first 11 chapters of the Bible. Moments such as God creating the world in six days, Adam and Eve being the first and only two people on earth in the beginning, the worldwide flood in the days of Noah, and the Tower of Babel are interpreted by some as nothing other than allegorical. This would mean that all of these events are pseudo-myths with no basis in physical reality but instead have a supposed deeper psychological message that is still true. Even though it wouldn't be true. I know, confusing. People like William Lane Craig, Michael Jones, aka Inspiring Philosophy, Jordan Peterson, and many more practicing atheists adhere to this type of strange interpretation while they challenge the authenticity of the words of God in order to give you their own Gnostic interpretation based on how their breakfast is digesting. In this segment, we will be defending the authenticity and validity of the creation account of Genesis from the Bible. Let's begin. Before we read anything from the creation account, let's look to a passage in Genesis 41 to establish something very important about the scripture. For those who are familiar with the account about to be brought up, Pharaoh was given two consecutive dreams by God that Joseph was to interpret according to what God had revealed to him. Let's listen to the interpretation of the dreams. Genesis 41 verses 25 to 27. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kine are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored kine that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. Did you listen to how Joseph had told Pharaoh that the thing presented in the dream was to be interpreted not as literal, but as allegorical? If you did, you would have seen how there was distinction made by the text to let you know what the items were to represent, and didn't just leave it for us to figure out without any guidance. With this in mind, at no point does the Bible say that the events of Genesis were supposed to represent something else. Psalm 119 verse 160 reads, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. If you were to say Genesis is not a book of science, and as long as you understand that God made everything, you're good, then that puts you in a tough spot because you're calling God a liar. Romans 5 verse 12 reads, 
Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The verse should be crystal clear. Nothing on earth had died until Adam had sinned. How could death have entered into the world until Adam's transgression, if evolution is predicated on death, death, and more death? If we read 1 Corinthians 15 verses 45 to 48, it says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is natural. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. Adam was not some man that was specifically set apart from a pre-existing world of men. Adam was the first man. And all men come from Adam. And the scriptures, if we are looking at it honestly and not just lying to ourselves, doesn't allow for any other interpretation. If we look at Jesus' genealogy in Luke 3, it clearly says Adam was the lowercase s, son of God. If you do not have Adam in this account, then you don't have Jesus, which means you would also have to accept the truth about what the Bible says about him and stop kidding yourself. Let's just look at Jesus' ministry for a moment and hear what he had to say about the events that unfolded in Genesis, whether he regarded it as history or not. Mark 10 verse 6, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Luke 11 verse 51, From the blood of Abel, Unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. In these references, you have the creation of man taken into account, where God made Adam and Eve, and then you have the death of Abel. One only has to ask, was Abel Adam's son? Answer. Of course he was, so why should we doubt whether Adam was a real person? Okay, one more example. Luke 17 verses 26 to 27. And as it was in the days of Noe, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Once again, Jesus is describing something that happened and didn't doubt the historicity of the account. Pay attention to what God said in Genesis 6 verse 17, as it reads, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. So, once again, when Jesus said destroyed them all, and God said to destroy all flesh, and everything that is in the earth shall die, that means everything and everyone on the face of the earth that was not in the ark would be killed. Jesus would know all this 
because he was the one that sent the flood in the first place. Colossians 2 verse 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Yet the entire basis of things such as evolution philosophy is based on man's delusions of grandeur, and trying to fit this into the Genesis account is antithetical to the word of God. The first attack the devil ever made was to ask, Yea, hath God said? And if he can get you to believe the most critical failure of man's existence was a myth, then you've fallen for the same lousy trick of believing ye can be as gods knowing good and evil. To end things off, 1 Corinthians 3 verses 18 to 19 says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Don't fall for the wisdom of this world. It's only subpar next to the truth the Lord's truth, which is his word.